Hope is alive, beautifully described in that song. And throughout history, there have been many memorable moments. A lot of us have learned and studied and can recall. But you see, none of them can compare to the extent, to the prophetic impact it's had. Or it, it has, it had and has, I have to say in past tense and present tense, because God is still doing stuff. Amen? Um, that, that hit that the star has done. Amen? You see, his star that changed history, more meaningful than anything than, than I, I don't know, wars or paintings or portraits or, or, or glorious soccer games or rugby games, anything that you can think of, the star, more meaningful than that when it shined in the sky on that beautiful night. And one of the reasons why it is, is because there was multiple prophecies that had been fulfilled, you see. Multiple prophecies. Heaps of prophecies that had been fulfilled. And I only want to name a few of them. One of them is that the virgin birth was fulfilled. And these prophecies, you see, were centuries ago before the time of Jesus, the time of the birth, before any of that. Centuries ago. And the other one was that he was born in Bethlehem and he, he fled to Egypt because Herod was doing some mean things in the community and that Jesus was a descendant from David. And there's heaps and heaps other more prophecies that, that were fulfilled when Jesus was born. But if we think about it, you know, it's easy to read it from a third person view. It's like, oh, you know, these prophecies were fulfilled and Jesus fulfilled them. That's really cool. But if we place ourselves back in that era, right? And if these are happening before our very eyes, well, that changes our hearts, that changes our perspective, that puts us in all of what's happening. I mean, imagine if hundreds and hundreds of years ago, someone prophesied that you were going to work at Pack and Save, or somebody prophesied that you were going to move down to Porirua. What if somebody prophesied for me that I was going to move here to New Zealand in 2013? That would be a bit freaky for me, <laughs> you know? If you, if you think back and you look at the prophecies as a first person po um, point of view, whoa, things start, to things start to change. And for Mary and Joseph and the wise men and the shepherds and all of those guys, man, they were experiencing these prophetic moves of God happening in their midst. Some very, very exciting stuff here. Very exciting stuff. That's why I, I, I want to say is that it set the trajectory in history for hope that's what these that's what these prophecies did because the trajectory is like the plane taking off Phew! you know what i mean bang it takes off and these prophecies took off when jesus was born so that hope would come down you see the radiant star signified that it gave hope for all and i love this story it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, no, Herod, I'm just, just, just teasing, but I will need help with this next word. Is it Magi? I think it's Magi. The Magi from the east came <clears throat> to Jerusalem. And I thought this was very fascinating to me, because the Magi obviously weren't from Jerusalem. They were from outside. Long, long, long distances away, way out there. And this is what it says next in the passage. It says, and when they arrived in Jerusalem, they asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? For we have, we have seen his star when it rose and have come to worship him. I think that's so fascinating. Is that the star that they saw and they're not even part of the Jerusalem and the Bethlehem community. I just find that really interesting. In a couple of scriptures down, it says that King Harold and <laughs> King Harold and, and and the people of Jerusalem, you know, were a bit disturbed when they when they heard about this. And I thought, Lord, how come you you showed the star to those guys? Did they see the star? Did they not recognize the star? How come you showed it to the guys in the far far east? I reckon it's because God wanted to give hope for everybody. Everybody. Not just for the Jewish community, but quite clear that God was signifying that he wanted to give his hope to everybody. 
Everybody. And so then the story continues on and it says that, you know, they're going, they had a conversation with Harold and they, they agreed to go to Bethlehem and go find them. And, then and as they come, they arrived. And when they saw the star, it says they were overjoyed when they saw the star. And I love that, 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 that expression is that when they were overjoyed, I'm going to leave you off. Because I thought, wow, how many of us get overjoyed sometimes at the wrong things? <laughs> I remember um, in my early years of a Christian, I'd get overjoyed at an inappropriate joke. But that was in my early years. God had grace for me. I've learned if I participate in that, well, I'm participating in inappropriate behavior and talking. Some of us get really, really hyped up for sporting teams who win victories, and I can understand why. You know, I'm quite patriotic for the Houston Texans, which is an American football team, you know. They beat the Patriots, who is sort of like the tension between, I don't know, Wellington and the Crusaders, I guess. And they beat them after years, and so I was a bit like, yeah, yeah, but then I, you know, suddenly thought, actually, you know what, it's just a game, you know. And even sometimes I get overjoyed a little bit when the Crusaders beat Wellington. Did you guys know that? <laughs> because it's God's miraculous power at work, isn't it? <laughs> For those who don't know, our senior pastor who's transitioning, you know, to to answer his calling for what God wants him to do next. He's a huge crusader. He's a huge Crusaders fan, because he's from the South. He's from overseas, you see. Yeah. <laughs> so the radiant star gave hope for all. Amen? <clears throat> Next one. Oh, yep. Sweet. And I love this next part, is that when the, when the Magi came, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother and probably the others. And, or, well, it says Mother Mary. I don't know if there were any others. But it said, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. They worshipped him. And I love how the Magi responded in faith and in reverence to this special, special baby. They bowed down in reverence to a special baby. You know, when, whenever I saw, you know, Mary and the baby, which, by the way, it was an actual baby. <laughs> Pretty amazing, eh? Um, it reminded me of my little boy. He was only uh, four and a half months old. And, uh, man, it's just, you see a baby like that, and, you know, coming, coming to the world, there's something special in itself. Imagine a king. Imagine Jesus, the baby. Before your eyes. You know, those sweet little hands, those sweet little feet, sweet chubby little cheeks, you name it. You know, his little fuzzy hair. All of that. It really touches my heart whenever I hear that story over and over again. Because that little baby is going to grow up to be, to be a global impact for the rest of the generations to come. Amen? Yeah. And I thought, Lord, I wonder if Jesus cried. Did he have any call at calm? Lord, did he have a baby rash? Lord, did he have a lip tie or a tongue tie? Lord, did he ever poo or throw up on, you know, Mary and Joseph? You know, I'm just thinking all these things, you know. I wonder what it was like. Like, was he a perfect baby? What was it like? Those are the kind of questions I, I have. And I reckon we probably did. You know, being a normal human baby. He probably did. And it says in Luke's version, it says that Mary pondered all of these things. And I bet, including the times when baby Jesus threw up and baby Jesus, you know, eh, you know, in the middle of the night. Especially traveling to Egypt. Whew, man. Traveling to Egypt with a baby? It's hard traveling with my son to, to Pada Pada Umu in a car. Not to mention to Egypt outside. Lots of respect to Mary and Joseph. Hey. So, this is my question. 
What will, you, what will your response be? What will your response be? The Magi responded in faith and reverence to Jesus when they saw him. And it's quite clear that Jesus is with us this morning. And so what will your response be? Will it to get overjoyed? Will it to respond and say, you know what? There was a word that, given, that was given about a fire in my heart and God wants to give me more. If that's for you, I encourage you to come and receive it this morning. But what will your response be? Because I'll tell you mine when I first heard this story. I said, Lord, why would you do that for me? He said, because I love you. You love me. But why? Because I made you. I love you. You are my son. I thought, okay, how can I respond to this? If you've given your life for me, this is what I said to God. I will give my life for you. That's the only thing I could, that's the only thing I could logically think of. I said, I will do this for you. Let me tell you, it's been a great adventure, lots of fun. It's been hard and challenging, but just because situations can get complicated and on the outside world, um, people can have opinions or thoughts or, or whatever, it doesn't mean and it doesn't change the story and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, I wanted, wanted us to know that. And as you know, after the scripture, they gave gifts. They said, we'll give him gold and we'll give him frankincense. And I imagine if there were three wise men, because I think there was probably a lot more than that. I think one of them would be a bit of a comedian and he would come in late and he would say, but wait, there's myrrh. <laughs> and Joseph would give him a fist pump and say, awesome dad joke. <laughs> Setting the tone. Because the truth is, love came down. Love came down. There is more than just the gifts. There's more than just the busyness of, of this Christmas season. There's more than just the weariness of planning and organizing and saving up our finances so that we can spend gifts on other people and for our children and for our family. The story is way more deeper and wider and longer than that. Because you see, this is the only, well, there's lots of scriptures, but I thought this one was appropriate. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. His one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. You know what I love about God fulfilling his prophecies? That he's a, he's a God of integrity. Is that when he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And he showed it and he fulfilled it. So when he says that when we believe in him, we will not perish and have eternal life, I can put confidence in that because he has fulfilled promises that Jesus was born. Amen? Yeah. I can put confidence in that verse and say, you know what? I will believe in you. Not just know, but I will believe. I will follow your lifestyle. I will believe in you by how I live my life. I can have total confidence in that and last night I had a really interesting time with my daughter as I was putting her to sleep we were reading this little story and it was about two rabbits there was a little rabbit and there was a big rabbit and as we're reading the story the little rabbit says I love you this much you know and then the bigger rabbit says oh okay okay well I love you this much you see and I thought oh this is a cool book so we're reading along and and it was really cute and so I asked Bella at the end of the story I said Bella how much do you love me and she thinks for a little bit. And she says, 6.30. <laughs> I said, oh, that's so sweet. Do you know how much I love you? How much? To the grass and back. She said, oh, I love you to the grass and back. And to the trees and back. And to the birds and back. She says, and I'm like, oh, wow, that's so touching, so touching. And the truth is, God loved us from heaven and back. Yeah. Amen? Amen? He loved us from heaven and back. That is really the story of Christmas. A father's love for his people that he would send his son to pay the price that all of us should pay 
so that we can be in fellowship with Him in heaven. Amen? Amen. That's why I want to finish with this. Is not just know the story of Christmas, not just tell the story of Christmas, but be a part of the story of Christmas. How you live, how you do things, and during this Christmas season, everybody, most of everybody knows the story of Christmas, but live the story of Christmas. Because I like to say that Christmas is this. It's the victory in history. Amen. 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 So, let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful that you've come down. We're so grateful that your son, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, has come down. Lord, that is a story that's worthy of, of, of our full attention, Lord. And we can remain focused on the victory in history. We can remain focused, Lord, on the real meaning of Christmas during this, what can be a chaotic season for most of us, if not all of us, during this time. And so, Father, as we embrace meaning and, 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 and the victory of Christmas, Lord, we want to come before you right now. We want to respond in the way you called us to respond, in faith and in reverence, and Lord, and to have you as, as Lord and not other things. And to not let busyness lord over us. But we can call to you as our Lord to help us and guide us through this season. So Jesus, be with us. <clears throat> as we go to the picnic and as we finish off, we pray, Lord, that you will be in our midst. So that others will experience a touch of what Christmas really is. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.